On today's show, we're going to take a look at what is new in the latest Lightroom CC update that is the one released on June of 2018. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show every weekday, every weekday, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right here at youtube.com slash photojoseph, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. Going live. The fun thing about live is you get to participate in the chat. I can bring you up in the chat. You can participate. You're here. You put my name. You type Photo Joseph in there. It shows up right on my screen as Mr. Curly has done. And, uh, and then I know that you're there and part of the show and I can answer your questions. We usually do the questions at the end. We'll do a Q&A at the end of the show. So if you have any thoughts, questions about what we're talking about today, or frankly, anything else you want to talk about, just get them into the chat and we'll address them as we go. If there's anything super urgent, Ryan will get in my ear and say, you got to address that one now. Otherwise, we'll hit him at the end. So today we're talking about Lightroom CC. This is the latest update. What was it? A version 1.4. And this is the cloud version. This isn't classic. We're, we're focusing on the cloud version here. And uh, this is an update that was released just last week. So this is in June of 2018. And there's not a whole lot of new features, but there's a couple things that are worth looking at. Plus, because I haven't really done this before, we're going to look back at a few of the features that came out over the last few updates that caught my attention. That We're not going to go through everything, but just some of the ones that I think are particularly cool. And just to kind of reiterate what we're looking at with Lightroom CC. Lightroom, you remember, was Lightroom, and then it became, well, I guess it was always Adobe Photoshop Lightroom was the full name, and, and at some point it became Adobe Photoshop Lightroom CC, CC for Creative Cloud. And then Adobe got clever and decided to make this whole brand new version of the app, starting from scratch, that is a total modern architecture. You've got to be like, Lightroom's been around for a while now, right? So a whole new modern architecture, uh, ultimately feature parity across Mac OS, iOS, Android, Windows. It should be the same everywhere. And for the most part, it's been feature parity as they've done these updates with a few, a few uh, notable differences here and there. But for the most part, it's been feature parity. But it is not everything that the original Lightroom was. So the original Lightroom is still around. Lightroom, so this is where it gets really confusing. It was called Lightroom CC. And now the new software is called Lightroom CC. The old software is now called Lightroom Classic. So I know it's kind of ridiculous in the naming. I really wish Adobe had done it different, done it differently in here. It makes my job as a trainer a lot more confusing. I'm like, no, I'm training you on Lightroom CC. No, not the old Lightroom CC, not the old class. Oh, forget it. So anyway, this is the new Lightroom CC, the one that is on all of your devices, which is, uh, it's fun. I'm really enjoying it. It is certainly not anywhere near feature parity with Lightroom Classic. But if you've been using this for the last what is it, like nine months or so that it's been out, if that, uh, they are adding really, they're adding new features quickly. There have been some really significant updates over the last few months, and it's exciting to see. I personally really like the idea of loading a shoot onto my laptop and then being able to edit pretty much immediately on my iPad. Um, if I'm on the road, I jump in a cab, I want to have, you know, have a few minutes, I can pull out my phone, on my tablet, on my laptop, and it's all the same everywhere. I really, really like that. For example, on this trip that I was on when I was just in Chicago, um, I had a shoot on Wednesday, the day before I left, which I didn't have time to edit before I left. And everything, every time I do a shoot, I have to think, am I going to put this in Classic or am I going to put it in CC? In Classic, obviously, if it's got more features. So I'll know. I know what I have to do for this project. Do I need Classic or can I get away with CC? And if I can get away with CC, bonus, that's where it goes. So for this particular shoot, it was simple. I just put it into CC and then I was able to edit on the plane. You have the ability to mark a album to store locally. So we can store all the images locally on the iPad so I know they're all there, ready to go, ready to edit. So I'm really digging it. I, I am definitely digging it. So let's, uh, let's get in. I've got a whole list of the features we're going we're gonna to look at today. Make sure we don't forget any of them. And the first one is preset and profile management and, uh, and actually profiles themselves, which are quite expanded and new in here. So with the previous iteration of Lightroom CC, which I'll call it 1.3, I don't remember what the date was it came out, they added presets. And if you were already using presets in Lightroom Classic and you had Classic installed, when it ran the update, it automatically converted and brought over all of your presets, which is really, really cool. So for example, I have a bunch of paid presets from Visco that I really quite like that I had in Lightroom CC. Those just automatically started showing, uh, in Lightroom Classic, sorry. Those automatically showed up in Lightroom CC. Pretty cool, right? So now you have, not only do you have those there, which have already been there, but you have the ability to manage those a little bit better. And you have the ability to manage profiles. So let's let's go in and take a look at it, and then we'll explain the difference between the profiles and the uh, and the presets. So we're here looking in Lightroom CC right now. 
Uh, on the right-hand side, down at the bottom, you see this presets. Now, if I open this up, there's the presets that what I was just talking about. There's the Visco ones that were imported. Uh, the last updates for the 1.3, those automatically got converted over. And so if I open one of these and I start rolling through the presets in here, you can see you get a preview immediately, what they look like um, before you even apply it, which is pretty cool, right? I mean, it's, you get that update almost immediately. Okay, it's not quite instant, but it is pretty quick. And keep in mind, this laptop, the one that I'm on here, this is a few years old. I, I tend to point this out often because I like to point out that you don't have to have the latest and greatest hardware. This is a 2014, so it's four years old now, 2014 2.8 gigahertz Intel Core i7. It's maxed out, 16 gigs RAM. Um, it's got a terabyte SSD, so it's, it's quick, but it's not the latest and greatest. So maybe even with the newest hardware, as you're rolling over there, you'd see those updating more quickly. It probably would, frankly. Uh, okay, so those are there. So now what's new in here is the ability to manage these. So up at the top of the preset, you have a manage presets option. You click that and you can turn off things. So I go, you know what, I don't actually need, I don't shoot Canon or Fuji. Um, I also don't shoot Olympus. And the Visco doesn't have presets for the Lumix cameras that I shoot. So I tend to use some of the Olympus ones or just the standard. And, and basically, they're just minor variations of the same presets. I can take a look at what those, what those look like in there. So I can hide those. In fact, here we'll hide the Canon. Actually, no, I think I use the Canon ones for mast. And I'll hide the Fuji X-Trans and the Nikon ones here. And now when I go back, I no longer have all those extras sitting in there. So it's just a, just a little bit of cleanup, which is nice. So um, if you have presets that you're not using, but you don't necessarily want to throw them away, you can do that. <clears throat> okay, so this is presets. Now, I said that part of what was new in this new Lightroom CC is you have presets and profiles. And the profile is quite significantly new in here. So what is the difference? Well, a profile is a look that is applied to the image pre any of the adjustments. So no curves, no shadow, highlight recovery, none of that is being applied. It is essentially a LUT, a lookup table. We are applying a generic look to the image based off of whatever that LUT was designed to do. And some of those are very simple. So let's get out of here. I'm gonna go back to the, uh, let's close out the presets here. And I'm gonna hit Shift R to reset, revert the image, make sure that's reverted. And then up at the top here, you see it says profile. I open this up and it is currently set to Adobe Color. And you have in here Adobe's new standard presets, or standard profiles in here. So you got Adobe Standard, Vivid, Portrait, Landscape, and then there's also a monochrome in there. Now, I can choose any one of these, and the idea is that you choose one that you know, looks the best, or you leave it on the generic one. And then there is a Browse button, that, by the way, gets you to the same place as choosing Browse here. So there's a nice little button here. I click on Browse, and that opens up to a whole bunch more. So, oh, look, we even get a pop-up. We're going to see this come up a few times, little pop-ups in here that tells us what we can do. Um, one of the things we can do in here is mark favorites. So you'll notice here we have some favorites that are already marked. I can open up, um, let's see here. Let's go down to some of the artistic ones that are down here. And there's a few artistic profiles in here. And if I like one a lot, like Artistic 06, let's say I can hit the star button on that. And that's now gonna show up under my favorites. There's, uh, where'd it go? Um, in theory, is it in there? Okay, let's try that again. It's not, not even showing up. It's funny, let's go Artistic 07. We had that, that added one more. Go up to the favorites. Well, there it is. Oh, yeah, they're there. Maybe I just hadn't scrolled down far enough. So they're in there. Um, anyway, so these, again, are essentially looks, lookup tables, LUTs that are being applied to the images before you do anything else. So there are the ones that come with it, but then there's this, which is really cool, the camera matching. So you know how on your camera, whether you're shooting Canon, Nikon, Lumix, uh, Sony, whatever, there are looks that are built into the camera. You can choose your landscape, your vivid, your dynamic monochrome, whatever, they're in there. And those generally are baked into your JPEG file. So if you're shooting RAW plus, if you're shooting JPEG only, you get an image that looks like whatever you assigned. If you're shooting RAW plus JPEG, you get both. You get your RAW picture, which is flat and raw. And then you also get the JPEG that has that look baked into it. If you're shooting RAW only, you will see that look on the back of the camera because it's built into the, uh, the embedded JPEG. Every RAW file has a JPEG built into it. You're looking at, that's what you're looking at on the back of the camera, by the way, in case you're wondering. But as soon as that RAW file opens up in Lightroom or Capture One or any software, it opens up and it reprocesses from the base RAW and whatever effect had been applied in camera goes away. What this is, is a collection of those same looks recreated inside of Adobe Lightroom. And what's really cool is they are manufacturer dependent. So if you pop in a, or if you load up a Canon photo, you're going to see different profiles in here than if you load up a Sony file or a Panasonic Lumix file or whatever it may be. So in here, when I look at mine, because this is shot on a Lumix G9, I see that there are these presets in here, and these are designed to mimic the ones coming out of the camera. So if I had shot in Vivid, 
in the camera and I was loving what I saw in the back of the LCD and then I loaded up in here in RAW and I go, wait a minute, that doesn't look like what I had. Well, now I've got that. It shows up in there, camera vivid, and away we go. So that is pretty awesome, right? We have that look just built into there. But again, this is not a preset. This is not adjusting my curves, highlights, shadows, and all that stuff. If I go back and I exit the profile, you'll notice all of these settings are still at their default neutral settings. So we have not applied a preset. So you've got your profile, which again, we can call a look, which goes on first, and then you can apply your, your either a preset or just go in and start manually tweaking things. So that that's all that whole profile thing is new in here. You can even import a profile. Now, I've done on previous shows here, actually it wasn't that long ago, I'll link to one up here. Uh, we did a show on building profiles using the Passport, the x right Color Checker Passport. You take a picture of the Passport, you run their software on it, and it creates a profile. That profile, again, can be read by Adobe Lightroom. If you're using Adobe Lightroom Classic, it, there's a plugin in there to do that, and then you create that profile. Lightroom CC does not yet have plugin support, so you can't do that inside of Lightroom CC. You could actually build the profile using x right Color Checker Passport's own software. I've never, ever actually done that. I've always done it through Lightroom, but they have a standalone app that gets installed when you install the plugin, and so you could do it there. Either way, you end up with a file, a file that is your color profile. Since Lightroom CC doesn't have the ability to create that profile because it doesn't have the plugin support, it does have the ability to import them. So if you created that profile using Lightroom Classic or using the standalone app, you can now import that in. So if we go back over to our profiles, go to the browse menu here, click on the three dots, I can choose to import profiles, and I've got one sitting on my desktop here. There it is, a .dcp file. If I import this, that's going to come in and it's going to show up under... Is it under profiles? Yep, there it is. Under profiles, there's the one that I just imported. And that is a profile that I created for this camera, not on this shoot, so it doesn't match this, but this camera under other lighting situations. Point is, there's the profile that's imported in. So that's new. That's new in CC. This is exciting. This really shows us that we are starting to see Lightroom CC get really more towards that professional use case. So we're stoked about that. Okay, so let's take here. Um, that is, yep, that's everything I want to do. Oh, I was going to show you as well, and I'll put this information down in the um, down in the description down below. But it's important to know if you do have, if you've created a profile using Lightroom Classic, and you want to copy that over, you got to know where it is. It's kind of hidden, buried deep inside of the system in here. So let's see here. I'm going to. Let's do this, um, go to a new folder, and it is, and again, I'll, we'll put this down below, but it is in the home folder, library, application support, um, Adobe, see it's, it's deep in there, Adobe Camera Raw, and <laughs> Camera Profiles, uh, Profiles, there we go, and there, there it is. So I open that, and these are, the, there's the DCP files, so there's the ones that, uh, that you might have created using your other using the standalone app. So that's that's where you'll find them. And again, we'll, we'll put that whole thing down below and make this a little bit easier for you to find. Okay, uh, so that's that one. That's, that's one, that's the first major new feature they got in there. Next one is copy and paste edit settings. This is huge, especially for the professional user. Quite often, if I'm working on a project, on a job, I will devise a look or do some basic adjustments to a single image, which I then want to replicate across all the rest of them. Especially if I'm shooting in a studio environment, right? I've got a consistent lighting, I've got a consistent setup, I've got a bunch of different pictures of uh, the people, the subject, the product, whatever it is. And I want to copy and paste that look across everything. I don't want to have to recreate, redrag 20 or 30 sliders to get that look dialed back in. You can now copy and paste the settings from one image to a single other one, or to multiple other ones. And you can do selective copy as well, so you don't just have to do everything. So let's take a look at that next. All righty. Let's, uh, we'll start with this picture here. I'm gonna go into, let's actually just do a reset, shift R, do a full reset on that, and open up the settings in here. Let's do something simple. Let's say I do a little little crunchy curve look on here. Uh, let's pull the highlights down. Let's just kind of blow them up a little bit. Let's make it a little bit hot looking. And I don't know, fine, that's it. That's all I need. So there's the, there's the look that I've just applied to this picture here. I go up to the photo menu, and I can choose copy edit settings, in which case it's gonna copy everything. Or more interestingly, choose edit settings to copy. So if I select this, I get a dialog that allows me to select which settings I want to copy. Not only, for example, the, well, the profile is just one thing, but let's say um, under light, not only everything under the light command, but if I open this up, 
I can say, you know what, I want my exposure, I don't want exposure, I don't want contrast, I do want highlights and shadows, I don't want whites, don't want blacks. And you can select exactly what you do or don't want to be selected in here. Hit copy, select those to the clipboard. I can now go and select multiple images. And then this is kind of cool. So I select those and I'm gonna say photo, paste edit settings, and we're gonna get a little dialogue that says, we're not going to get a dialog. I lied. Maybe it's only the first time I did it. It gave me a dialog. The first time I did it, that's interesting. It should warn me this again. The very first time I did it, it popped up a dialog that said, hey, you can't paste to multiple images in this view. You got to go back to the grid view. Or there's a hidden keyboard shortcut, command shift V, V for paste, obviously. Never understand that one. And that will apply to everything. So you can see from the thumbnails down here that it applied it to this first one, but not the rest. But now I'm going to hit command shift V, paste settings to six photos, and now all six of these photos got that look applied to them. So there you go. So hidden keyboard shortcut, it will tell you that the first time, I actually, I actually thought it was going to come up again. Let me see here if I hold down, if I'm holding down various keys to see if I can get that to pop up. Sometimes if you hold down a key like I'm pushing option right now, you'll see some of these commands change to tell you what their hidden settings are, but that would not appear to be the case here. So anyway, just don't forget command shift V. You will get warned the first time and never again, apparently. I kind of wish it did, but it would be helpful. Anyway, so there's that. So copy and paste the settings. Super happy about that. Incidentally, I'm showing this to you on macOS. This is, the vast majority of these things are on iOS and Android and Windows as well. So if you see something here that doesn't show up on your platform, rest assured, it will be there soon. It's it's coming. Okay. Um. Thank you. And uh, let's see here. Let's go on to, uh, actually, let's, before we go, let's go one, one thing before we jump into the next feature. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this up because I'm going to forget if I don't. That is this, our value for value proposition. I just want to remind you guys that we on this show operate on a value for value proposition, meaning if you feel like you have earned a value, gained value from this show, then we would certainly appreciate it if you would consider putting some value back into the show. The best way to do that is to visit photojoseph.com support, and you'll see on there a bunch of different ways that you can support the show. You've got Patreon, you've got PayPal, you've got our entire affiliate store. You can jump over to lynda.com where you can watch my training there. Or if you really want to, you can actually hire me directly, which is kind of cool. Also, I want to remind you about the trip to India. We're going to India early next year, January 30th to February 9th. We're going to India. If you go to photojoseph.com slash India, that will tell you everything about it. This is going to be a photographic adventure to end all photographic adventures. It is going to be epic and huge and awesome. And I hope that I will get to see some of you out there. That would be cool. So, and I know a couple of you already are coming or planning on coming, so that's great. Okay, let's... Uh, Let's move on. Value for value, we appreciate it. All right, so that's copy and pasting settings. Next up is a simple one, HEIC image file support. HEIC is the high efficiency image codec. Yeah, I think that's right. That you get out of, um, out of your, uh, what do you call it? Your iPhone. So if you're shooting with an iPhone, the latest iPhone now, it's instead of shooting to JPEG, it's shooting this high, high efficiency image format, and you can now support those images, bring those in. So just as a point of, just to demo it, just to kind of show, if I go in here, so we go to my little demo folder, I'm going to choose import and um, import, and I'll do it from here. Click on the plus menu. Hello, let's try that again. Click on the plus menu, go to the desktop. I've got, there we go, Lightroom CC demo. There's the ones. You can see HEIC images right there. I'm going to select all of these plus a movie, and I'm going to say review for import. It says preview unavailable for this, this file. That was a movie file. I'll explain this in a moment. Click on add three, and it is going to tell me that that movie is not available to view. Okay, so what was that movie? Well, let's first start with the basic picture here. This little picture of my kid playing on the racetrack. You can see up here, this is in fact an HEIC file. So there's the file. So this is now being supported in here. If you're wondering what that is, this is the new format that is on uh, iOS, also of course supported in macOS. So when you take a photo with your iPhone, it takes up less space for the same image quality that uh, JPEG would. So it's just a more efficient image format. It's a new format. Other apps out there are having to add support for it. Adobe has now added that in this version of Lightroom CC. So that is in there. The other thing that you get off your iPhone is a live picture. So if live pictures, we've done demos on that before. In fact, I'll link to that up here because we did a really fun one where I was showing off moving water and all these diff different ways to use the live photo mode. If you, and those photos, those live photos are stored as HEICs as well inside of the Photos app. If you export one of those, even if you go into Photos and you say export original, it exports the HEIC file, but it also exports a movie file, a small movie to play that animation because only Photos app will, will look at all the images inside of it, all the frames inside of it, which is essentially a miniature movie, and play it back. Because other apps aren't going to do that, it creates both the still file and the movie file. 
However, the movie file did not import into Lightroom CC. So even though we got the, the still photo, so that was the still photo, just a little waterfall picture there, that imported in, the movie file did not. So if I was to, let me go to the desktop real quick here and open up the movie file itself in QuickTime. So here you can see the file names. Um, uh, there was the HEIC, there's the equivalent movie file to the little three minute movie or three second movie. And that's it, that's all there is to it. And if I command I info on this, we'll see what this is. And it is an HEVC movie, unsurprising, a high efficiency video codec movie. And that movie file format is not being supported by Lightroom CC. That will be supported inside of Final Cut. I'm sure it's supported in Premiere by now, it must be, but it is not supported in Lightroom CC. So um, that's probably will come as well, just that there's a little, little important designation there to know the differences of. Okay, that's that. Uh, next one, reset photos to the last opened state. So we've always had reset to original. I've used it a couple times here. So you're working on a photo, and you go, eh, let's start over, hit reset back to the original. You also obviously have undo, 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 undo as many times as you want. But there's a new feature in here, reset to last open state. So if you launch, let's say you, you, you're working in Lightroom CC, you've done a bunch of edits to that, you shut it down. You come back the next day, you open it up again, and you continue working. And you go, ah, you get to a point where you go, yeah, I want to go back to where I started this morning. I don't like what I've done today. You now have the ability to go back to the last time it was opened, as opposed to going all the way back to the beginning. It's a simple little thing, but I think it can make a big difference. Because I don't know about you, but there are times where you, you sit down, you think you're in the mood to edit, or you are you have something in mind, like, oh, I want to try something new today. It's a fresh day. It's a fresh start. You're trying something different. And then you go, yeah, it just, it, it ain't there. It ain't there. So you want to go back. You don't want to go back to the beginning. Because I already did a bunch of work that I was happy with, and now I went and screwed it up. So I basically just want to get back to where I was this morning. You now have that capability. So if we go back into, let's go back to the photos. Um, go back to the photo that I looked at earlier. So, well, when I opened this, I had opened it at a default, uh, original setting rather. But you'll see down here, you have reset to original and reset to open. So there's nothing applied to these. That's why it's not there. But if I just go real quick, and I did something to this, now I'll have those options. There we go. So reset to original, reset to open. So, um, you know, it's worth it's worth having that, worth remembering that that is there. It's a uh, slightly different keyboard shortcut. Shift R to go back to original. Shift Command R will take you back to the last opened. And I personally think that is a really, it's a really useful feature for the reasons that I, I just mentioned. I think it's kind of cool. All right, simple one. Next one, specify share settings for a web gallery. So the web galleries built into Lightroom CC are getting better and better. Now you have some new options in there. You have control over those options. And as I'm going to show you right now, this has actually got it to a point where you can do client delivery with it, which is pretty cool. Not like super advanced client delivery, but you can do client delivery. So let's say that, uh, let's say this shoot right here, this is my product shoot. I'm ready to go, ready to share it with the client. I go to the, my demo folder here. I right click on it and I choose share album. This pops up a dialog with a link to that album. And then some preferences in here, allow downloads. Do I want to allow my client or whoever's looking at this to download the photos? I can do that. Do I want them to be able to see the metadata? Do I want them to be able to see the location data? And of course, if I want to just stop sharing, hit that and it will stop sharing it. But all of this, this copy this link, send it to your client or to your family or whoever it is, and you have these options over what's going to be controlled or what's going to be shared. What's pretty slick about this too is that since this is all CC based, all cloud based, all of these images are already in the cloud. All the changes that I've made are being updated virtually instantly to the cloud. So when I do share, it generates a link and I don't have to wait for it to upload. It's already there. All it's doing is now making that existing album public with the settings that I have defined on there. So that's pretty slick. This all has to happen, of course, if you're currently online, if you're offline, if you're on a plane or something, or in airplane mode, you don't have the ability to share and the changes that you made while you're in airplane mode will still have to sync up. But under normal use cases, you hit share and everything is available virtually instantly, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. So there you go, share settings on that. Uh, little one, sort photos by file name. You'd think, well, how obvious is that? Why isn't that in the there in the beginning? But you know, a lot of the little things are just kind of coming, trickling in as we go. But down at the bottom, if you're sorting in grid view or whatever view you're in, if you click on this little icon, little drop down next to the sorting, you now have another option. You now have the ability to sort by file name. And uh, this is this is handy. I, I'll tell you the one of the reasons that I would really like that is for a multiple camera shoot environment to be able to sort by file name. If you had named the files on import using the file naming structure that I have talked about before, where I put the shoot name followed by year, month, day, hour, minute, second, and then the original file name. So now you've got 
photos from multiple cameras, which one of them might have been image one and one of them was image 500, now sorting by name puts them in the right order. And right about now you're thinking, wait a minute, you can rename files on import into Lightroom CC? No, no, you actually can't, sorry. So that's something that if you're using Lightroom CC, you do still have to do that separately. I actually did a article, I don't think it was a video, I think it was an article on that, on how to rename before importing using uh, Automator. So I built an Automator script. I've written how to build that script yourself and provided one for download if you want to do that. We will link to that down below. That is an article that you can check out and grab the um, grab the file if you want to, and that'll allow you to rename your files before importing. So it's all based on Automator. It's quite simple and straightforward, but it's kind of a cool thing. So if you want to rename your files, I've given you the ability to do that. Okay. Uh, that, uh, let's see here. Oh, the last one on here is kind of silly, but it's here. Get Lightroom CC Mobile by texting a download link to your phone. So if you're on Lightroom on the uh, desktop and you can't be bothered to go into the App Store or the Play Store and find the Lightroom CC, you can go up here and say, get Lightroom CC on mobile, select that, punch in your phone number, and it will send a link to you. Very, very exciting, clearly. Okay, let's take a quick look at some of the uh, previous things that came in. So that, that's everything that was new in the June update. Um, I'm going to quickly get on, hit on some of the previous ones because I haven't done one of these in a while, and I want to make sure that you see some of the major updates. And if you if you want to see every single update, we'll put a link to that down below as well so that you can see Adobe's own list of every feature. So if you've been updating automatically and you haven't been reading the release notes, you may not realize what's in there. It's worth taking a scan of this list and seeing like, oh, I did not know they added that a while ago. That's kind of awesome. So definitely do that. Uh, so we're going to take a look at a couple other things. Before I do that one more time, um, I do want to throw up another little house ad here advertising my GH5 training. If you're a GH5 user, please do consider purchasing my training. It is a five and a half hour extensive training on the GH5 at gh5training.com. Tons and tons and tons and tons of information about the GH5 in there. If you're a GH5 user, you most certainly will want to check that out. So please do. It's awesome. All right, uh, let's take a look at a few of these other things. What did I want to do? Um, create and manage presets. So we talked about managing the presets, that the managing itself was new, but the creation of, new in this version, but the creation of presets was new just as the previous version. So we looked at the fact that all your old presets from Lightroom Classic were automatically converted over. That's great. But now let's just take a quick look at how you would create your own and, uh, and obviously apply those, which you've already seen, but we're going to take a look at the creation part of it. So let's say... So I'm going to go to, uh, well, let's use this picture here. So use this picture here, and I want to make some changes to it. So let's do a shift R, revert that thing. And I don't know, let's, uh, let's do a little curve in there. And I'm going, to, I'm going to make kind of a cool, funky look. Let's go into the blue, and let's, uh, let's pull the blue up into the shadows a little bit there. Do something kind of fun, a little purplish in there. Oop, too much. Let's get that down a little. That's looking kind of cool. Maybe make it a little bit higher key, take those highlights up a bit, dig in it. Okay, so there's the look that I want. I'm happy with that. I go to the preset menu. And under the three dots, I choose Create Preset. And we'll call that um, Purple Portrait. And just like when you copy the settings to, your uh, to the clipboard, you can choose which settings get copied. You can do the same thing here for the preset. And it's automatically disabled tools, which is, would include your linear gradient and your radial gradient, because that's the kind of thing that generally is applied specific to an image. You know, the gradient needs to be in a specific place. Uh, also, geometry, that is usually unique to a particular photo, not the kind of thing you want to copy and paste over. Um, thing, but then things like your color settings, your effects, your detail settings, all those, those are all stored in there. So you can disable or enable whichever ones you want. You can put these into whatever group you want, create your new group, or just drop it into user presets. Click on Save, and there it is, Purple Portrait. So as I roll over these other presets, let me hit Shift-R to reset everything. You'll see the presets that are in here. Of course, I hit on Purple Portrait, and it just applies that, and that is applying that actual preset. Another new thing in here is the healing brush. So let's zoom in close on her face here and let's close that out. And uh, let's say I want to do a little bit of retouching. The retouching is new as of a slightly previous version of Lightroom CC. So you got our healing brush. Just tap the H that brings that up nice and simple. So you have two different modes, heal and clone. We're going to leave it in heal. Your size can be changed by dragging the slider here or just scrolling the mouse. So I'm using the trackpad on my laptop two-finger scroll to change the size of that. You get your feathering and your opacity, and I can just go down here and click on a spot. So let's, um, I don't know, she's, uh, let's just like little one there, click on there, click on there, and you'll see it's showing me the place that it's cloning from, cloning to. So if I do that, look, okay, this is perfect. Oh, I couldn't have asked for that to work out better. So I clicked on a spot here, it was a tiny little blemish on her face, and it shows a clone source where she has a little freckle. Well. Okay, I don't want to get rid of her freckles, but I don't want to add new ones. So I can move that clone source like so. 
and we've got it. We also have this visualize spots option, which helps us to see some of the odd spots that might be showing up. Let me zoom out a little bit. I'll actually take that back, zoom back in. And as I drag the threshold on here, I can start to see the kind of things that I may want to get rid of. So let's pull it down a little bit. And now I know that that is a beauty mark and so are these here, but maybe that one there I'm looking at, maybe, you know, this is obviously her nose, this is obviously her eyes, but maybe that's something I want to get rid of. So it's a good way to find it, look at it and go, oh, you know, maybe I want to get rid of that one. In this case, I don't, but, you know, I'll click on that and away you go. So the visualize spots feature is super, super useful in there. So that's something that is new in this version. Chromatic aberration control is new as well. Here's a photo that I did yesterday and shooting this uh, sculptor every once in a while comes in with some of her new work for me to photograph for her. And ironically, now this is actually kind of funny. I'll tell you the story here. So I did these primary edits in Lightroom Classic because I was I built a color profile. Um, that's probably the only feature that I needed Classic for, the building the profile. But I built a profile and, and away we go, and away we went. But then I noticed on this particular photo, there was some purple fringing in there, a little bit of purple fringing. So if you look very close, it's kind of hard to see. But there's a little bit of purple fringing happening in here. Now, in Lightroom Classic, even though as far as I understood, we're using the same rendering engine, that purple fringing was notably more significant in Lightroom Classic. And in Lightroom Classic, you have extensive defringing tools. You have a defringing on a brush. You have a defringe command with a color eyedropper, so you can select the color of the of the of the fringe that needs to be defringed. And when I did that in here and I clicked on that purple, it, it went away, perfectly went away. However, what was really, really interesting was when I looked up here at the top of the image, let's zoom out a little bit, uh, there was this halo that had come up around, zoom in too far, around here, this edge. Lightroom Classic made this halo around it. And so I was able to get rid, I, I, I couldn't use that feature, I couldn't use the eyedropper because you don't, you couldn't localize that adjustment. So I did two different, oh, I should, sorry, I'm closer here. Um, there was a halo right around here, it was super weird. So I ended up, first I did two different versions of it, brought them into Photoshop and Compton together, but then I realized that the defringing brush, which has no adjustments other than amount, but the defringing brush in Classic actually fixed the problem, so that was fine. But then for today's demo, I opened up this file into here and realized there's even less of a defringe happening, which is kind of interesting. And the ability to defringe, which again is a new feature here, is just a single checkbox, but it worked perfectly. So check this out. Let's go back down to the bottom of this photo here. And let's find that purple defringing. It's, again, I'm zoom in, it's subtle, right? It is subtle. Admittedly, most people are probably not see it, but it is there. If I go to my adjustments and scroll down to optics, there's a little remove chromatic aberration there. I click that and it's gone. See, the purple has just been desaturated. That's effectively, as far as I know, what it's doing is just finding that, that known purple color that shows up in defringing and simply desaturating. I turn it back off. There we go, disable it. You can see that again, back on, back off. It's subtle, but it's there and the rest of the image is totally intact. It hasn't done any of that weird haloing around here that I was getting in Lightroom Classic. So that's interesting to me because it tells me that the algorithms that are going in here are not just copy and paste out of Lightroom Classic. They are in some cases redoing things. And in this case, that single checkbox has worked perfectly. So I'm pretty stoked about that. So if you're looking at any of your photos and you see a little bit of uh, chromatic aberration, I know one of the demo photos I've used a bunch of times before is a photograph of a, a spider web with morning dew on it. And it was a macro shot, uh, it was very shallow depth of field, and any of the threads that were slightly out of focus got some fringing. And the ones that were really out of focus have massive fringing on them. And so that's usually the photo that I'd use for a demo. So I'll have to, I'll have to dig that photo up and try it in here with this one checkbox and see what happens. But, but uh, for this little example, it worked out really, really well. Okay, we're just about done with the show here. So remember, if you have questions for the Q&A, get them into the chat. Get, for those of you who are watching live, get into the chat and we will hit the Q&A in, uh, in just a few minutes in here. Okay, next one is um, healing break traumatic operation. Oh, the other one I wanted to talk about was the, com the long exposure capture without a tripod. And this is a tech preview that is, of course, on the iOS because it's for taking a picture, so it wouldn't be on your laptop. Um, but what this does is it allows you to do a handheld long exposure without having to have a tripod. Interesting. So now I haven't tested it in a really low light situation, but I did find that it does allow for a long exposure motion blur that works out quite well. So let me fire up the camera here in Lightroom CC. Let's see here, actually we'll do it like this. Um, are we synced up? We are. Let's bring up the, there we go. There it is. So I'm going to uh, hard press on Lightroom CC 
and it brings up take photo. Pop the photo that's going to open up the camera. And to enable this, you have to first go into the, go all the way back here, tap on the Lightroom button in the top left. Let me show my touches. Let me just enable that real quick. There we go, show touches. Okay. So starting at the base level, um, the LR logo up in the top left, if you tap on that, it opens up your settings. Scroll down to the bottom, it says technology previews. We open that. And by default, it's off this long exposure. Turn that on. And now when you go into the camera, uh, oops, close that. Uh, Get opened up. Where's the camera? Sometimes it's just too hard to find these things. There we go. Open up the camera on there. We tap on that. Down in the bottom left next to the shutter button, it'll probably be on automatic by default. You can set it to long exposure. So again, long exposure, low light, handheld, no tripod necessary. That's the idea. But let me do, just do it like this, I suppose. I'm going to try and hold this really still and take a picture. Did you see how it said hold steady on the top? Let me do that again. And I'm doing a terrible job of holding steady, so let me let me do this again. But you saw it was a long exposure, the yellow bar moving across. And well, that was not a good example. Oh, you know what? There's too much light in here. That's why. Let me do it. Let me just kind of do this under the table. Here we go. It's a bit darker. Oh, this is a very exciting demo here. But you can see it. You can see what's happening up there. And we're getting some of that motion blur happening in there. There we go. So it, not a great demo because it's just too much lighting here for this. But if you were to do this in a kind of a dark waterfall type situation or you put an ND filter in front of it, you could probably do that and get a nice result out of it. I don't know. Um, but ideally, it's really designed for that whole uh, low light, just, you know, in a I don't know, dark room trying to get a nice picture. Whatever. It's a technology preview. Check it out if you're doing that sort of thing on your iPhone. It's worth looking at. All right. That's everything I want to do here. So we are going to go into the Q&A. For those of you watching live, get your questions ready. Pop them into the chat room. We'll bring them up on screen momentarily here. For those of you who aren't watching live, well, you're just going to have to put your questions in the comments later, and I will do my best to address them either in the chat or in a future show. We will be right back for the Q&A.